Welcome, everybody. We're going to take you down into the trench today and give you a different perspective. John has uh, set this up really nicely. Let me take you back in time to the year 2008, where I was given a distinct privilege of becoming the commander or CEO of this organization here. This is 140 Cavalry Airborne in the state of Alaska. I would show up that spring, assume command of this organization, and we would spend the next year uh, preparing for combat. We were destined for Afghanistan the following spring, 2009. We wound up here where that yellow star is in a province called Paktia, about the size of Rhode Island. That's where my force occupied along the eastern border of Pakistan, a very dangerous area where a lot of insurgents would come and go across the border and wreak havoc against U.S. forces and, uh, and the Afghan military and government. That's what it looked like right there, very arid climate. Uh, that's the set of Candel Pass that goes up to 10,000 feet above sea level. Very dry, very rugged, uh, no roads, electricity, very, very barren. My headquarters was not far from here, about 8,000 feet above sea level. This place gained fame back in the 1980s as the Afghan Mujahideen took on the Soviet Union and eventually chased them out. So it had quite the history as we showed up in the spring of 2009, and it would live up to its reputation for sure. We stumbled across an opportunity. So we got into theater about February of 2009, and by August, we were a really highly functioning team. And we've been doing a lot of intel collection, and we had this long list of HVIs, we call them high-value individuals. Uh, those individuals which, if we plucked them off the battlefield, would have positive effects in terms of what we were trying to do in this war. So we've been doing a lot of intel building, and we got to this moment in late August where we found one of those guys and uh, really soaked an area with intel, all kinds of different feeds, to determine whether he was actually there and got a small task force together to go in after darkness and kill or capture this individual. Sun goes down and the ground is still warm from a day's beating by the sun. Its skies are clear. Conditions were perfect for this kind of operation. We had a team assembled of infantrymen, engineers, supporters, civilians uh, that were in theater with us, like FBI agents, former cops, to really help pull this operation together. Put a lot of intel on that spot. Uh, just after midnight, we launched a task force to a small compound in our area to kill or capture this individual. They touched down in multiple helicopters and penetrated this objective and using technology, were able to pinpoint the individual on the objective and capture him. I was back in my headquarters monitoring the operation, supporting it. And I got the call from the ground commander that they had gotten their guy. He reported back with the code word that we had our guy. It was a win for us. The war was certainly not over. There was a lot of danger ahead. But for our organization that had worked hard together, you know, climbing this hill, it was a win for us. And we celebrated shortly and got on with our business. But it was a big deal for us. So you're probably wondering what this has to do with business. What in the world am I trying to, what point am I trying to make and how is this related to entrepreneurship? Well, it's related pretty closely, we believe, in that the CEO. We've examined this quite a bit. John and Mike and I and the team really do a lot of work in trying to figure out what are the obstacles to get more veterans as business owners. It looks something like this, this jagged arrow. It's not a straight line. It's not linear. It's not a smooth path at all. It's jumping into the trench to get to the right side of that slide on the very top in that late August evening to conduct a raid. You go all the way back and started with an idea, much like business, right? I want to be an entrepreneur or I want to be a soldier. I want to serve my country. I want to join the army. So there I was, and I wrote a blank check to my nation, payable with my life, to commit to something bigger than myself. Off I went into the military right now, bottom of the trench there, and I didn't know a damn thing. I didn't know the language, the culture, anything like that. And it was tough. And I went through uh, basic training right after I got in, and that's where I was 
starting to question myself, among others, oh, my God, what did we just get ourselves into? It was tough. It was the trench. It was rough. Uh, they were breaking us down. No longer was it Rob Campbell. It was uh, Lieutenant Campbell, the soldier. Climb back up to the top of that. This is me fresh out of my initial training, ready to show up to my unit and become a leader of men and women, infantrymen, paratroopers. I was at the top of my game, physically fit. I'd been schooled in the profession. I was ready to go. Right down into the trench, right, where that weight is there, where we as a unit formed together in the spring of 2008. Sloppy, messy, we don't know each other, trying to feel each other out, falling flat on our face in training exercises, skinning our knee, but learning and growing together to prepare for that spring of 2009, which takes us up to the top again, where you see that parachute. We deployed at the peak of readiness. We had trained as hard as we possibly could. We had formed a team that was tight, cohesive, and could do, could take on anything, could accomplish the impossible. We were good. And then we show up in theater early in the spring of 2009 and come right back down to the bottom of that arrow. It was rough. Uh, the rigors and complexities of, co of combat were taking their toll on us. We had a brand new team that came together that joined this core team of mine to form this bigger task force and all that went with it. We had to get systems running and in place. They'd become comfortable with how we operated. Very rough, very sloppy, very dangerous. But over time, we got good, really good. And it took us to that evening in 2009 where we achieved success. So we at Vet to, uh, Vet to CEO believe a couple of things, that we as veterans are the perfect candidates for entrepreneurship because we have traveled paths like this, getting into the trench. And all that experience that goes with it prepares us for that late August evening wherever you may be in your own business. But you got to jump in the trench, and there it is right there. I love, I love this little graph, the startup curve. So that dotted line right there, that's the surface of the earth, all right? Everything below that is the trench, and it's nasty down there. It's smelly. It's bloody. It's muddy. It's just awful. There are skeletons down there of previous entrepreneurs that gave it a shot and ran out of money or didn't ever had a market like John said and didn't survive. There's bankers down there with their arms folded, shaking their heads at you, you know, and that money that you want to receive. There's investors down there laughing at your cockamamie idea on the business startup, that idea that you want. It's tough. There, you know, there, there's not money down there. There's just all kinds of, of, tough times as you exist in that trench, but you've got to get in it and you're going to need some help getting out. It's above your reach. You can't do this by yourself to come out the other end uh, where you see that scale sign. You know, you see two people in this picture here, but behind them was an extensive team uh, of people, machines and systems to support them and what they needed to do. We didn't do anything alone ever in our training and in combat. And entrepreneurship is very much like that. Let's talk a little bit about who we are as entrepreneurs, those that decide to dip their toe into the pool on the deep end of entrepreneurship. Now, bear with me a little bit because I'm going to generalize, maybe even stereotype. But I'm all, I do this only to make a point. And I call this optic here safe bets. There's no absolutes. There are certainly truths and falsehoods on either side of this, of this slide here. But this is what I call safe bets. And I'll start on the veteran side. And by the way, anytime I say veteran, I'm always, I'm always talking about their amazing spouses, absolutely amazing uh, women and men that bring a lot of what you see here in their own right just by living a military life. So it's a safe bet if Emily and Noah come in and they want to start a business that they bring to that endeavor problem solving. We, pro we solve problems daily in the military, very complex ones. We get really good at identifying root causes and uh, identifying the problem and then bringing solutions in. Leadership, even if they only served a few years, 
you know, they, they've, they've got some leadership. They may, may never have led in the military, but they've been in an organization which solves problems through leadership. I say often that the military does just that. It solves problems through leadership. A business solves problems through money. Okay. Again, no absolutes, but just to make the comparison there. They're hardwired with values. I'm hardwired with values, and I'm almost five years since my transition. Loyalty, duty, selflessness, all things that are really critical to entrepreneurship. You ask any seasoned entrepreneur, and they're going to be talking about what's really important is that stuff right there. But Emily and Noah are not perfect. They bring, you know, some problems, some challenges as they step into this. They won't ask for help. We're not good at that as veterans. We, we know we, it's embarrassing for us. We, our pride is too big. And we think because we did what we did in the military, you know, we can overcome anything. We won't ask for help. They're in the middle of transition stress. We hear a lot about PTSD, right? That's the, uh, the vogue term of our times. And it's a very serious thing. I don't mean to, to downplay PTSD. There's a lot being done in that area. But only about 7% of veterans really suffer with PTSD. The real stress is transition stress because we transition from something very familiar, this band of brothers and sisters, into the abyss, this unknown of society. It's akin to being placed in a foreign country. So our brains are working harder to adjust our language and our ways and learn new things, and that can manifest in transition stress. It's real. I say often transition is trauma, and it is because when your brain has to work that hard and adjust uh, that big to something new, it's traumatic. The language of entrepreneurship, we don't bring that strength in. Hell, we don't even use entrepreneur in the military. It's hard to spell the damn thing anyway. Thank God for spell check. I hate typing out this word. But it's not language that we use in the military. You know, we speak task and purpose, time on target, mission command. We don't speak the language of entrepreneurship, cap raise, cash flow, pro forma, uh, all those new terms that I myself am learning in my own entrepreneurship journey. We don't understand money. <laughs> That's a big one, right? But it's true when you think about where we come from as service members, money's never an issue. Never once did money get in the way of something I wanted to do. I was certainly a good steward of government funds. I did have a budget. But I never I don't recall seeing any dollar sign on any uh, mission slide operation that we were conducting. There was always funds to support that. How we've been operating off of a blank check. Wait, had somebody turned to the president, said, Mr. President, we could save $250,000 from this mission. We pull one helicopter off and six Navy SEALs. It's absurd, right? That wouldn't happen. We've got money, and that's never an issue. But in business, that's obviously very different. We're risk averse. Again, you wouldn't think this. We go into harm's way. We serve in the heart of darkness in very dangerous places. But we do so emboldened by a team and a system that's behind us, just like those two men you see in that night vision picture, that big team behind them. That allows us to be brave and go do what we do. But we analyze risk ad nauseum in the military, and it's crazy. And we delay missions until conditions are perfect. I delayed an operation in Afghanistan for five days because weather wouldn't allow me to get evacuation helicopter in to evacuate my casualties should we take some on the objective. So I waited five days, and then we pulled the mission off. Even special operations teams will wait weeks until conditions are perfect to go in and do what they need to do. And they do what they need to do only after an extensive risk assessment, listing out the risks, putting mitigators in place, moving forward. Hell, in a business, you're operating off of a hunch, a gut feeling sometime. You know, you're gambling. And that is not a familiar place for veterans. The last thing is we're isolated. John teed this up very nicely. You know, we get out there and we can't reach out to our left and right and touch anybody. There's nobody there. All right. Banker's not going to come for you at three in the morning. They won't. Uh, nobody cares if you can't make payroll. No one's going to be there to assist you. You can't call a medevac to come in and bail you out. Let's move over to the other side of the equation and talk about non-veterans. Meet James. Okay. Again, I'm generalizing, right? There's truths on both sides of the equation here, but I just want to make this point. 
What James brings into this journey of entrepreneurship, he's got some business acumen. He may never have, never have run a business, but he's worked in the business. He understands that cash flow is the life of a business, right? Better than the, his veteran counterparts and spouse counterparts. So he's got that acumen. He's got some training and experience, perhaps. He's got an MBA. He's been in that space longer than we have. He's got a network that probably exceeds that of a veteran. Many veterans don't even sign on to LinkedIn until they're right on the cusp of transition. Well, James has probably built that out over years, especially if he's in and he's been in an industry for a while. He has that. And that's an advantage. Now, what he might be lacking is some leadership. You know, there's no leadership training or education in an MBA. There's none in college. There's none in high school. Right? Too often, leaders get put in place because they're smart and they perform well at a task. And therefore, we believe they can lead well. He probably doesn't have the problem-solving acumen and strength that Noah and Emily might. He may not have faced as many, perhaps. And he's a member of the drive through Window Society. Well, I use this a lot. You know, by the time this uh, webinar is over, I could order dinner, uh, book a vacation for my family. Hell, I could probably buy a car with my thumb. And we've become so enamored to this convenience that we think business and entrepreneurship is the same way. Drive up to the drive on window. I will have a number three meal startup with fries. Thank you very much. And off you go. It's not that way. It takes time. And that can be a, a fall. Veterans have that, too. We're all kind of members of this drive through window society. Here's a really important point. And I want to close on this slide here. Let's bring Noah, Emily, and James together. Think of the power of these three individuals in an entrepreneurship venture, whether it's buying a business franchise or whatever it might be. Think of the power of that, how they can, uh, you know, complement each other. I've got, uh, I've gone through and built a few business plans in my time. I'm a big idea guy, but I don't do that now without some sort of non-veteran counterpart that has the experience that I don't. Really important. So when service members transition out of the military, there's this hyper focus on get a job. And here's why. Back in 2008, when the economy was really bad, the Department of Defense was paying near, uh, up, upwards of a uh, billion dollars in unemployment insurance. That is, a service member gets out, can't find a job, and they file for unemployment. The military picks up that bill. Well, that's obviously not where they want to put money, understandably. right? So there's this hyper focus on get a job just to get a job. It's not about uh, the right job for you, you know? And we're asking the wrong question when we transition. John, thanks for your service. You did eight years or you did 28. What do you want to do next? What job do you want to get? The real question is, who are you? Figuring out what makes you tick, what you're really passionate about. And I submit 80%, it's probably not your military occupational skill or your MOS. So there's this hyper-focus on get a job, get a job, get a job. That drumbeat just continues. But here's what happens. 68% of veterans will leave that job within two years for a variety of reasons. Could be job passion misalignment, could be bad leadership, could be a variety of things that occur. This is a study from Syracuse University that tells us this. Why would we jump into a mission where there's a 68% you know, rate of failure? Why would we do that? Well. That's what happens when you get a job. Now, look, we are not adverse to jobs in vet to ceo It is one of the paths, not necessarily an entrepreneurial path, but it can be a vehicle that can take you there, all right? Maybe there's another way. Maybe there's an exit we can take to entrepreneurship, right? Maybe you go get a job for a while. You know, certainly most of us have to put food on the table, support a family, and that's fine, but keep your eye on the long target of entrepreneurship. And maybe that's the exit we take. But we got to change the narrative here on entrepreneurship. We really have to look at this differently and, and get away from this, you know, Shark Tank stuff we see on TV or these pitch contests where you've got three people on stage fighting for the big prize, right? Well, what about the other 97 in the audience that have great ideas and want to go do something? We've got to really change this narrative, you know, getting away from Startup, startup, startup. I don't know a single seasoned entrepreneur that would say startup is the way to go. So there's a lot that needs to be done, and we, we counter that narrative in Vet to CEO very much. Let me introduce you to somebody. This is Emily right here, 
and she's on drugs. She just took the gateway drug. I didn't know what that was, but I took it myself. Let me tell you what the gateway drug is. Brandon Sheldon, a friend of mine out in Charlotte, introduced me to the gateway drug, and this is it. You got a business idea, so you get yourself a tax ID number, file with the state, you get a website, get some business cards, poof, you're in business, right? Just like Emily, she took that drug. No, you're not. All you have is an idea. You don't have a single customer or client. You have zero cash flow. That was Rob Campbell, spring of 2017, fresh out of the military, wrote a book on leadership. It's personal. And I was thinking to myself, right now, man, I could turn this into a business. Absolutely. So I did. Got my tax ID, my website, and business cards, and my wife and I celebrated. We are in business. Rob Campbell Leadership. No, we're not. We got an idea. And that's it. That's all I had. Spring of 2017. My first client didn't come until January of 18. I had to go work for somebody for free just to prove to them what I could do. It is hard, hard stuff. Don't take the gateway drug. Be smarter than that. Here's the different paths, right? Let's consider these other paths. Start up or start later. Let's start there as startup. Don't give up on your startup dream. Most of our students that come to Vet to CEO have a startup idea they want to move forward with. By all means, right? But there are massive obstacles in front of you. I'll tell you a quick story. Well, I'll save that one for the franchise. But start up or start later. Maybe you want to uh, disrupt the landscape industry, pick up a rake. Go work in it for a while. What you might discover is, yeah, this isn't quite it. That's not quite what I want to do. Take the long game. Get a job. Bring in some money. Save your money. Bring your debt down and get ready for that startup moment because it's going to be expensive. And you need more of what James brings, that acumen. Okay? We don't squash or get in the way of startup. But we just want to be honest with you. It is very hard. And I will tell you from personal experience, I would not have done startup. I might have gone with franchise or buy existing. And I'm looking at both of those options still today. Let's talk about franchise. My partner, John, here really opened my eyes to franchise. He and I were talking about this, doing some whiteboard work. That's what we did in the military. I was in 21 different organizations in the military. Each of them franchise-like. They existed long before me. They had existing people and structure and systems, even market share, right, if you will. All I did was come in and take them to the next level and make them better. That's what franchise is like, and that's what we as veterans are actually really good at doing because we can go in and grab a new team and move it out pretty quickly, and that's what franchise brings you. Really worth exploring, lots of opportunities, and we invent a CEO. I've got a great network to really expose you deeper to franchise and teach you more about it. Work in an industry. We're not against a job. Again, take the long game. Let me tell you a story about uh, franchise. I'll go back here a minute. Uh, one of our board members, Chase, Marine Raider, uh, tip of the spear, Marine Special Operator, um, superb rifleman, gets to the 13-year mark in his career, long before he had any kind of retirement, and decides to transition out. He had a young girl. He saw a future of constant deployments and taking them away from his family, made the call to transition. Chase woke up one day and he said, you know what? At that 13 year mark, I don't want to be a rifleman anymore. I want to clean carpets. All right. He had that epiphany. Not really, but he went into a carpet cleaning franchise and he does well at it. And that's not his passion. He's not passionate about cleaning carpets. He brings the skills that he, he brings into that business. He went and got an MBA. But that franchise is a vehicle for him to get to another place. He doesn't quite know what that is yet, but that's the startup dream down the road. But it's a revenue engine behind that dream, and that's what that can be. Okay? Buy an existing business. One of our uh, teammates here, Mike Horn, did just that and didn't use his own money. Let me tell you, if we can do it, guys like Mike can do it, and John and I, you can too. We are partnered with the Veteran Business Project. I invite you to go check them out. Uh, they really opened my eyes to this one. So 50%, over 50% of veteran business owners across the United States are 73 years old and above. And many of them don't have a transition plan. They don't have a family member to hand that business off to or anybody else. 
That's a massive transfer of wealth and opportunity to veterans that's staring us in the face. But the problem is nobody's talking about it. I had no idea that I could actually buy a business because we think well, we got to have this big checkbook. No, you don't. There's ways to do this and we can show you how that is. But we really want to open the aperture here to the other paths and entrepreneurship. Serve, don't sell. Veterans want to serve. I talk to veterans all the time, you know, three or four of them a week that I've never met before. And when they talk about what they want to do next, we certainly talk about who they are, try and get to that core passion, core purpose. When we get to the what of what they want to do, they want to serve. I hear things like, you know, I want to be, I want to develop leaders. I want to get in and make a difference in the community or in a company. They want to serve. They don't just want to go in and get and make a bunch of money. You know, certainly compensation packages are important, but serve, don't sell. That's what's going to attract anyone to your business anyway. Most businesses have a cause behind them, but they don't talk about it that much. They talk more about what they sell and what they do. I worked with a company recently that brings technology solutions to rural areas in the state, brings internet out to areas that don't have it through building relationships that's in their vision. That's powerful. I can get behind that. The vision I could see is this mother that's able to homeschool her children in a very rural part of the state because of what this organization did. It came in and built a relationship and served that community. Really powerful stuff as you look at your entrepreneurship journey. All right, you got to commit. I mean, you got to commit if you're going to do this. All right, there's Rob Campbell right there. Second Lieutenant, brand new to the Army, right in the middle of Ranger School, U.S. Army Ranger School in 1990. I lost 30 pounds. I was operating off a couple hours of sleep, one meal a day. Save for combat, it's one of the hardest things I've ever done. Very, very tough. But I had enough of a sense that the road ahead was not going to be linear and easy. There were going to be ups and downs. And I needed to prepare myself to the utmost of my ability. I needed to commit. I needed to get the MBA, if you will, of the infantry, and that was Army Ranger training. I knew I needed to do that. And here's the thing. My instructors were Ranger qualified, right? That's the uniqueness about our program. John and Mike, while veterans, have been out for decades, which gives them decades of experience in business, and they'll be the first to tell you about what they got wrong. And you don't hear that much, you know, in narrative. So what we typically see is that guy or gal on stage that started this company or took over this company and took it to this amount of revenue and sold it for whatever amount of dollars, right? I'm Rob Campbell. I commanded 1st Brigade of the 101st. I took that brigade and made it the number one brigade in the Army for human resource performance, and we led our division in retention. And then I sold it for $1.2 billion. <laughs> No, of course not. Couldn't sell my brigade. But what use is that to anybody? None. What I ought to be talking about, you know, I made a lot of money selling my business. And let me tell you about all the things that I got wrong so that you can, I can prevent you from making the same mistake. That's the narrative we got to counter and get away from these people on stage that made a lot of money. So what? All right. But you got to commit. I knew the path ahead was difficult. And in 1990, the Soviet Union had just withdrawn from Afghanistan. And who would have thought, nearly 20 years later, I'd wind up there. So I had to commit, and I had to be ready. I dare you, John and I dare you, to jump into the deep end of the pool here. It's tough. All right, I just told you about the trench, but high risk, high reward. I am an entrepreneur. I'm proud to add that to the things that I'm most proud of in my life. If there were decisions I needed to make over, I'd marry the same woman, I'd join the Army, and I'd become an entrepreneur. I'm the captain of my own ship. I own my schedule. I do what I love doing. Believe me, it's hard. It's hard work. It's not easy. John, Mike, and I didn't come from wealth and walk in, you know, with a bunch of money to throw at this. We had to work at it. We had to jump into the trench and get bloody. But the reward is, is wonderful. It really is. You can come out the other end and do something really fulfilling. You can serve. You can make a difference. 
And that's what entrepreneurs should do. So I dare you. Steve Jobs sums it up nice. Those are those who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones that actually do. You know, don't give up on your crazy idea. You're on to something. But just think about the different paths that can take you there. Take the long game. You can't go through the drive through window. I appreciate it, everybody. Great to great for you to be here. And uh, I'll hand it back over to my partner, John.